Hey everybody, this is Tommy Miller. I'm the senior pastor at Legacy Church. We're really excited that you decided to join our podcast this morning. Our intention is to give you the information and the resources that you need to bring heaven to earth by walking in the fullness of your identity and your destiny. Enjoy the sermon, enjoy your day, be blessed, and do what Jesus did. ready to get into the word yes turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 4 and uh, while you're turning there I want to extend an invitation to you how many of you know that we are extremely passionate about ending uh, any racial divides in our city and our community and we have partnered with the african-american churches we've be um, we, we've been vocal about not just uh, what's the right word do you remember when they had the, the church shooting down in the Carolinas? A, uh, a black pastor from, from that church said, we, we know that the, the, the white churches in town love us, but your silence on the issue of race is deafening. So it's not that just we have to be tolerant. We have to celebrate racial unity. Um, one of my dear friends, probably one of my, my best friends, Rashid Asamad, is the, the senior pastor at Dover First Baptist. and He's a wonderful man, uh, and he knows my heart, and he and I have teamed up to, to try to take as many opportunities as we can to bring all of the communities of our city together. Um, and he's invited me to speak uh, just a short, short piece of the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Service tomorrow night um, at 7 p.m. So if you guys can make it to Dover First Baptist, I believe it's just off of, uh, would that be Worcester? Um, by like CVS, um, Speedway, uh, I'll, I'll get you, we'll post an address on, on our Legacy Church Facebook, um, but it would be fantastic to have all of you come, and, uh, and I'm honored to be able to speak at such a, a milestone event, so they host it every year, and, uh, and they were gracious enough to extend an invitation to me, um, so no matter what, uh, I would love to, sh- to, to show up with as many people as humanly possible to- tomorrow night at 7 p.m., cool? Who thinks they can make it? Absolutely. Awesome. All right, Ephesians 4, verse 11. Say amen when you're there. (coughs) You guys will wake up. It's okay. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to be a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love, we would grow up into all things into him who is the head, Christ, for whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causing the growth of the body for the edifying itself of itself in love. Can we pray? Father, thank you so much for another opportunity to gather. Father, we, right now we ask that you give us revelation on what your design is for your ecclesia, your church. Father, we want no other models. We want no other opinions. Father, we want to see exactly what this governing assembly is supposed to look like from heaven to here. So we ask right now that you give us revelation, that you open our hearts, that you clear our sinuses, and, and enable us to successfully communicate your word and receive it in our hearts. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. I feel like I could say everybody said, and you all would. Like all of us have that thing going on. It's driving me nuts. So let me, uh, let me elaborate just a little bit on what we're going to talk about today. Perry High School just endured their sixth student suicide this year. There's no common stream of any kind of community, any particular age group, any particular income group. They have endured suicides from grade 8 to to last year's graduates. And for something like that to happen, we have to to closely observe what's causing it. As a matter of fact, we had our administrative assistant call uh, Perry School and Perry Christian Fellowship and say, our resources and our people are at your disposal. What can we do to help? And they said, we don't know. 
we, we, we would love your help, but we have no idea what to do. So that sends us, or I guess that I should say that we have the responsibility to then determine what is the root of such an epidemic. We have epidemics in this county that, that are caused by something. And when people can't put their finger on exactly what's causing it, we as Christian people have to ask for prophetic insight to be able to see what we have to correct, what we have to transform in order for our children and our grandchildren not to grow up into the exact same culture that we're witnessing take people out day in and day out now in our city. So, everybody say Ecclesia. How many of you understand that our Sunday morning service is the front door into the Ecclesia? It is not the de destination. It's the beginning. This is the least important meeting of the entire week. We love that you're here. It says to not forsake the assembling together. But this meeting is completely in vain if it does not result in spiritual maturity, authentic relationships, and transparent community. Because allow me to give you a little insight into what I truly believe is the cultural problem that leads our cities, the most wealthy, the most populated, and the most digitally connected cities, to be also the most depressed and anxious. My wife and I had the opportunity, our, our best friends, Travis and Leslie Wright, went through one of the, the most tragic things any parent could ever go through. They, they had uh, their, their son due on October 4th. And on October 1st, Travis and I were having coffee at the Daily Grind. He had a call from Leslie. She had some stomach pain. And he said, hey, bro, I'll be right back. Just got to go get my wife and run her to the hospital. And uh, it was seriously 12 minutes later, if you know how fast that, that is, from the Daily Grind over to the east side of Philly and all the way up to Union Hospital. 12 minutes later, he calls me frantic. He says, bro, you got to get here. The heartbeat's gone. So I ran over. I found a ride up for my wife. And, and we went there, and, and Ezekiel had passed away. But being people of faith, we fully believed that we were going to bring him back. So my wife and I spent not just three days in the hospital, but, but the three days after the hospital between the funeral and the calling hours. And I had the honor of, of leading the, the ceremony for my best friends. But let me tell you something strange. And let, let, me, let me make your life make sense. We didn't eat or sleep for six days. Our house turned into a giant disaster. We paid absolutely zero attention to ourselves, our needs, our priorities, or our schedules. We wiped them clean for the good of our best friends. And though it was the most tragic thing that we've ever witnessed, something about a person made in the image of God thrives and finds satisfaction in an environment of unity, service, and selflessness. Am I right? Did you ever wonder how you can gather as a family after a funeral meal and miss it the next week? Is this making sense to you? You're there mourning the death of a loved one, but because somebody died, it's the only, it's the only time we'll clear our schedules enough to find authentic community, to put our fences to the side. You'll talk to Aunt Jane this time because she's not, you know, it's not worth being ticked over anymore, right? We've got serious issues at hand. Now we're all gathered at a funeral Cracking jokes like, we, like there's never been anything wrong. And for some reason, a week later, you find yourself missing the funeral. Am I the only one? You guys know what I'm saying? We have to set the standard for authentic community. We have to set the standard for true, authentic relationships. One of the, uh, the, the assigned readings for the Legacy Academy of Kingdom Living is a book called Tribe by Sebastian Junger. Uh, if you get a chance to read it, by all means, read it. If not, jump on and watch, watch his 20-minute TED Talk on YouTube. He did four tours as a war journalist. He's a very rugged guy. He's well-built. He's got a square jaw. He's as tough as nails. And he goes into war zones with pictures and notepads and typewriters, and that's it. He's not armed. He's not there to fight. He's just there to document 
combat. In the first three tours he did, he came home and they said, okay, we need to do your debrief. We need to do your eval. And he was coming out of the service and the first question they ask you is, do you feel like you'll have time or be able to adjust to civilian life? Will you have post-traumatic stress disorder? First time, obviously, he had to wait and see. The second time, he said, no, I was fine. The first time, there was no problem. The third time, no problem at all. Fourth time, he's over in Afghanistan just a few years ago. He comes out, same answers. Do you struggle with post-traumatic stress disorder? He's like, no, I, I adjust comfortably. And then he, he literally leaves the debrief. He gets on the subway. And on the subway, his knees start knocking. He starts dripping sweat from head to toe. His palms are sweaty. He gets tunnel vision. He collapses on the subway. And all he can do is army crawl out of the subway back into the substation. And he's like, what on earth just happened? He said, that was the least amount of combat I've ever seen in a tour. I was rarely in danger. And if I made it through the other three tours with bullets whizzing through my tent, and this time I was completely safe, why on earth do I feel like I'd rather be at war than at home? You guys, follow me. So that's, that, that obviously spurs his journalistic instinct to do some research. So he starts researching uh, indigenous tribe life. He starts researching other cultures. He starts researching addiction and suicide. And he finds out that all of these problems are cultural. They're not scientific. They're cultural. Meaning if it's not true in every culture, in every state, among every demographic, no matter where you go, then it can be transformed because it's a cultural understanding and not something that we just have to deal with. That's the first piece of good news. So he goes to like uh, and, and studies the Navajo Indians and he goes and he realizes that everybody there has to serve in combat. If you're a citizen, you're a soldier. There's no two ways about it. And they transition from war to peace seamlessly. It's like, let's have dinner, then let's go kill. And then let's get done with killing and come back and say, where's my dinner? Like there's absolutely zero mental shift in what they do. So he started studying this phenomenon and wondering why all of these, these soldiers in, in tribal life in North Africa and all of these other places didn't suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. And then he came to this conclusion. Post-traumatic stress disorder is not a result of seeing combat and having a hard time transitioning to a time of peace. Post-traumatic stress disorder comes from being in the environment that humanity was made to thrive in and being released into a society that could give a crap less about you. Soldiers feel guilty because they miss the war. They don't understand mentally why that would be appealing to them. But it's because they, they were in an environment where brothers would give lives for brothers. Where people would go without sleep to make sure that you were safe. That all of you were gathered with a common goal, with, with something in your hearts that you're willing to die for. And then you get released from this environment into a place where somebody won't even look up from their cell phone to acknowledge your presence. We have to set the standard, guys. Gathering here on a Sunday morning and then leaving to our busy little lives that consume all of our time is the reason, follow me, is the reason that our children are choosing suicide over life. There's no other cultural difference other than the closeness of their community. And it's not just the family unit, it's everything. You've been in a situation where you've had to give every ounce of your well-being for the good of another person, and you cannot deny the fact that it was the most satisfied that you've ever felt. So why, in light of that information, wouldn't you and I take a step into something that is going to be revolutionary, that's something that will actually be transformative, and stop being so dang busy? Stop being so irresponsible. I can, take, I can tell when I slip into a mode of self-preservation, I am the enemy of everybody that I'm around, including my wife. It's just absolute nonsense. And you're never satisfied. 
And we slip into these modes of self-preservation and then we think, when I get this, I'll be happy. When I make that much money, I'll be happy. When I'm in this kind of shape, I'll be happy. And, and we do all of these things that we think are going to satisfy us. But the only thing that will actually bring satisfaction is a transparent, authentic community of believers that are there for one another. When you pick up the phone, listen, you're coming out of drug addiction or you're coming out of alcoholism or you're, you're in a bad marriage. And you say, bro, I'm, a, I'm about to pick up. And they say, well, you know better, Scott. Like, whatever. I hope there's no Scots here. Well, you know better. Jesus would be so mad at you. No, that's not the reason. I'll be right there. Don't move. Tie yourself to a chair. I don't care what time it is. I'm on my way. And I'm going to make sure that that needle doesn't go in your arm one more time. And I have to stay there for the next three days to make sure that your life comes to the place and the destiny that God's called it to. Your life at this moment is more important than mine. We have to stop. We have to set the standard. This Sunday morning is our front door. And if this front door doesn't funnel us into authentic communities, authentic places where people can say, bro, I can't do it anymore. And not get beaten and feel bad for it. Listen. In the book of Acts chapter 2, I just want to make this make sense because you're like, well, this is a pretty, pretty decent sized church. We can't all be friends. That's very true. I won't deny that. But this church is not bigger than any of the churches in the New Testament. Any of them. The very first church on the very first day that it opened its doors had 3,000 members. It's in Acts chapter 2. If you've never seen it, it's there. Check it out. And by Acts chapter, the end of Acts chapter 2, they already realized that their Sunday morning meeting was not conducive to authentic relationships. It said in Acts chapter 2 that after they gave themselves to the apostles' doctrines and teachings, they went house to house and broke bread with one another. And they had gladness, simplicity at heart, and favor with all the people. And let me tell you how these two things work against each other. Before you leave here, set a lunch date with a family that you don't know. Fellowship shouldn't have to be forced. As a matter of fact, you really shouldn't be forced to get along with people you don't, you're not like. You don't have to do that. There's enough people like you here that you can make a community out of the five, six, ten people that you get along with. Now, I'm not to say that, that the Spirit won't bring diversity into unity, but don't force it. But you have to embrace it. You have to make your, your, your Wednesday night show less important than somebody coming and crashing your house. How many of you have ever had somebody show up unannounced? How many of you get this thing inside you? It's like, how rude. That's what's wrong with the world. <laughs> You're like, God, like... No, but truly, how ridiculous is it for us to care more about what our house looks like than the life of a human? That's what we're saying. My, my outward appearance is more important than you wanting to see me. How flattering is that, that somebody got in their car, drove to your house because they enjoy your presence? And you're like, oh. And then you and your wife are like, honey, um, the, the Joneses are here. Like... <laughs> <laughs> That means in the time it takes for them to get their coats off, clean everything. Like, <laughs> how about we just agree as a community that we don't have to have clean houses to visit? And if you come to, to our house and I don't have anything cooked for you, I'll order something. Or we can just agree that we're going to start a fast when you walk in the door. <laughs> Whatever. Like, we have to throw our excuses to the side. We met as, a, uh, as the academy students for the first time last Tuesday. And, and watching this poetry in motion made my heart cry. Like, it was beautiful. Because those people made it through the door. They had transcended Sunday morning and they had found a community of people that have the same desires that they do. So they're sitting in a room and, 
and we, we ask the question, to, the, kind of like an icebreaker, what's your name and what's the one thing of your life that you wish was more kingdom? So everybody, without hesitation, without question, just bared it all in front of 19 other students and two instructors. And we left there after a three-hour meeting as a family. That's all it takes. And then you have to agree to continue, to continue to honor one another, to pray for one another, to meet with one another. Honestly, what is in your calendar that is more important than the life of a human? And listen, we might not all even, even have the unction to commit suicide. But the fact is, without human community, you will never be happy. Because God made us in the image of a community. And his prayer was, Father, just like you and I are one, let them be one. And when the world sees their unity, they'll know what we're like. So this Sunday morning, listen, we have a greeter team. But how many of you know that greeting is planned? It should make you feel better. But it's not going to provide somebody for you to call when you can't take it anymore. It's not going to be the ones that, that, that can pick up the phone in the middle of the night when you just can't sleep, when you can't make it through what you're going through. Now, I said those things to say this. We're, we're raising a generation of high schoolers that are more connected than any young generation has ever been. They can, they can talk to their newfound friends in Peru in a half a second. But because they're busy talking to people that will never actually be able to form an authentic relationship with them, authentic relationships are discarded for the sake of fake ones. We pursue likes on our tweets more than we pursue authentic relationships with humans. Make sense? Now, I'm not mad, but I am passionate. And I am super hopeful because this is the truth. Remember this saying for the rest of your life. Anything that is cultural can be transformed. Anything that is cultural can be transformed. And what I mean by that is, is you cannot do a math equation that takes your present circumstance and determine how a human should react. I have friends from North Africa who have seen their parents murdered. They've lost children. Uh, they, they were saved when, when they were about to hang a, ro a rope around the tree. And guess what? They were saved by authentic community. There, there are young people in Uganda who have been forced to kill their own parents. Enslaved, we, we, enslaved in a rebel army and forced to kill innocent people. And then when they escape, they escape into a community that loves them, embraces them, and, and unconditionally loves them. And guess what? They move to the United States and they start phys physician practices and, and law practices. And they're not depressed and they're not upset because the presence of community erases the standing presence of depression. The Bible said that anxiety in the heart of a man causes something bad. I forget what the next part is. But a good word makes him glad. Like just, just us being people is the solution to a lot of what you and I deal with. You with me so far? That was the longest intro that I ever should have preached. But let's, let's talk a little bit about the first century church just so we can get a good foundation for this. In the book of Ephesians chapter 4, it shows us the structure <coughs> of the New Testament church. It says, He himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry and the edifying of the body of Christ. So when, when you come in here on a Sunday morning and you receive a word or a, a teaching or uh, 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 music ministry from somebody that's a five-fold minister, an apostle, prophet, preacher, teacher, and evangelist. They are there to equip you for the work of ministry and the building up of the body. It's twofold. 
So when we come in here on Sunday mornings, you're actually being prepared to be a healthy community for the building up of the body. We are referred to as the body of Christ on numerous occasions for very good reason. Because God designed the body himself and he understood that making the connection between the body of Christ that he designed and the body of Christ that that would fill the earth, he knew that one of the properties that every body possesses is the ability to take care of itself. It says the apostles, prophets, preachers, teachers, and evangelists are here to equip you to take care of each other. To build up the body. I had a meeting with a doctor. eh, It's probably been about a year ago now. And he does not believe in his practice. He believes in helping people and treating people. But they've got requirements on on issuing medications. And how long for for certain uh, levels of pain. And he said it's really tough. Because every single doctor learns that the body will fix itself within three days. He said if you've got a headache. You've got a pain response that will go take care of that headache. how, How many of you ever smashed your finger in a door? What happened? Somebody show me what happened when you, sh- when you smashed a finger in the door. Ah, right? Five other fingers came and wrapped themselves around the one that was in pain. And it's instinctive. You don't look at it in pain and lonely and abused and bruised and bleeding and say, my God, tweet that. <laughs> Right? We would rather take a picture of our pain and put it on Facebook in a passive aggressive way and hope that people respond to us to make us feel better about our pain rather than having a body come and heal it for us. It's true. There are six children at Perry High School that will not graduate. There are 12 parents that will not get to see their kids walk across the graduation stage. And there will be more if we're not willing to get over ourselves in order to take care of one another. This is super practical information. Listen, the Bible says this in in the book of James. And let let me show you how far back this was a problem. In the book of James, James says, you show me, or you tell me that you have faith. He said, and I will show you my faith by my works. And then the next thing he says is this. If somebody comes to you and says, I'm cold and I'm hungry, and you say, be warmed and be filled, brother, and you walk away, what good did you do for them? He says, give them food and cover them up. He says, if your prayer for someone does not lead you to compassionate action, it is of the utmost hypocrisy. Well, brother, when you're hurting, just call me. I'll pray. Sure. Prayer's good. But faith without works is destitute of any life, and you might as well just keep your mouth shut. Oh, man. How many of you know what intercession is? We think that intercession is standing in the gap for somebody. Where on earth did we get that? The Bible says that Jesus interceded for us. Do you know how he became us? He didn't stand in the gap and wish us well. Man, I hope this turns out all right for you guys. Man must be rough to be destined to hell and no way out. Jesus, I'll pray for you. No, it says, He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The Bible says when one of us suffers, all of us suffer. 
And when one of us rejoice, we all rejoice. That means that their problem is your problem. And if you feel connected because you've prayed for them, yet you stay disconnected from taking their problem personally, you've done nothing. Are you okay? Because I'm not mad. But people will die if we don't change this, so I'm really passionate. We do things. Now, I'm not trying to be mean, but listen. We do things in in American culture to feel connected to a problem. And because we feel connected to a problem, we feel like we're starting to solve it. But the fact is, being connected to a problem doesn't solve it. We could have a suicide rally and raise awareness and feel connected to a problem, pat ourselves on the back. We we, we bought free water for everybody. Everybody got a sweet new t-shirt. But people still killed themselves after the rally was over. Why? Because the good people that actually have a solution feel connected without actually being a part of the problem. When I say being a part of the problem, I mean coming into the community that has a problem and finding a solution to it. When you intercede for someone, you stand in their place, not in the gap. Jesus died as you so you could live as him. He perfectly demonstrated what authentic community looks like. When my brother's got a problem, it's my problem. When my brother's got something to celebrate, I've got a reason to celebrate. Listen, what's crazy is, listen, and and I'm not trying to get confusing on you, but if that's the way the kingdom is supposed to work, then how do you suppose that the system of this world has flipped it? When somebody has a reason to celebrate, we get jealous and we make them feel bad. Oh, they just bought a new car. Well, you know, they got late bills. Oh, well, they just inherited something. I didn't. Why is it always those, time, those kind of people, right? What's supposed to happen in the kingdom when somebody has a reason to rejoice, they're rejoiced with. But what happens when somebody has a problem, when somebody has a problem, rather than mourning with them or as them, we distance ourselves because, ugh. Now, <laughs> how, much, how much time of your day would be consumed if you meant it when you said, hey, bro, how's it going? Usually it's offensive if somebody actually answers the question. Because you're, you're looking for, great bro, how are you, right? What if they grab you by the shirt and say, I can't take another step. I'm so stressed, I'm so anxious, I'm so depressed that I need somebody to give me the next two hours of their life or I'm going to lose their mind. What do you do? I have not looked at my notes yet. I think this is relevant. Is this relevant? So let me encourage you. I'm not not going to quite finish yet, but I'm getting there. Let me encourage you. Before you leave, don't don't feel pressured. Listen, uh, don't feel like you need to just find someone and say, hey, we're supposed to be friends. Pastor said so. (laughs) That doesn't work out real well. But there's at least another couple in here or another single person in here single ladies will you raise your hand single men look (laughs) just trying to help you all out (laughs) this Sunday morning service is the front door and, it, and it's the way that we come into authentic relationships and authentic community. People get mad when they come into churches that are growing. They're like, well, we can't be friends anymore. Listen, the reason you loved it so much when your church was small is because you had what the Bible and God designed you to have, and that's authentic community. But if you forsake the growth of the local body at the, the expense of your feelings without finding a small community to belong to, then you miss the heart of God. The church in Ephesus had 26,000 members. Yet, there were communities within the church of Ephesus that spent all of their time together. You don't have to register as a small group. You don't have to meet twice a month. You don't have to, you have to be friends. And I promise, every single one of you in here is longing for it. And if your relationships come in the form of a small group, listen, I get to see all the small groups. I know that some of the small groups operate like best friends. Hold on. Important message. Very important message. 
<coughs> Some of the small groups operate like best friends. Some of them operate like Bible studies. Either way, it's cool. I can tell you that we need more of them. And I encourage you now to maybe sign up to become a small group leader. Listen, if you don't want to teach, you don't have to teach. The Bible says that they went house to house, breaking bread, having gladness and simplicity at heart. If you have the local Domino's phone number and at least two chairs, you are qualified to lead a small group. Don't be scared. If you, if you say, I'm willing to open my home so we can have authentic community, why don't we do this right now? I'm feeling it. If, if you say, I am willing to open my home so that we can have authentic community and you're willing to have six, maybe eight other people come join you at least twice a month, raise your hand. One, two, three, four. Got it? That's Aaron Jones. He's our small group coordinator. He's going to be reaching out to all of you. And make it real. Okay, see Aaron afterwards. Because he doesn't necessarily know who he just turned around and looked at all the time. Okay. Can I ask a question? Will you raise your hand if that bore witness with your spirit? Because that's not my message for today. Okay. Let me give you a quick nugget and we'll get out of here, all right? <coughs> the church will not accomplish what she has been promised to accomplish until we realize that the church is a community and not a meeting. The responsibility of our effectiveness will rest collectively on each and every one of our shoulders to see ourselves as the church, as the ecclesia, the called out community that's meant to, to, to magnify the person of Jesus. In Acts chapter 2, when it says that they broke bread house to house, having gladness, gladness of heart, simplicity of heart, favor, and gladness with all the people. That is what should be taking place during authentic Christian community. You're happy, you're simple, and you're full. I mean, there should be food present. And there are three things... That was four. Three things that healthy community does to inspire people to encounter God. The first thing is authentic community is the evidence of the glory of God. Did you hear me? <coughs> With the Sunday morning service being our front door, there is nobody in the world that has ever seen the fullness of God operate in a one and a half hour corporate meeting. Matter of fact, let me put it this way before we get to that point. We have a saying, uh, Wayne Woodard and Brandon Bunnell and myself and Tom and Tim Cameron, we've got a meeting every week that we just kind of get together and encourage one another. The, the, the authentic community that I'm talking about, I'm a part of, Truly. And we've got a saying. The saying is, don't miss the meeting. Everybody say, don't miss the meeting. <clears throat> Wayne was stuck in snow on his hill one day, and the Lord said, don't miss the meeting. So he, he, he braved it down there, and he got there. Another time, he was uh, running late from work, and he was going to cancel, and then God stretched some time for him, and, and he made it. Listen, don't miss the meeting. Things happen when people get together. In the book of Acts chapter 2, the most significant act uh, in human history next to the crucifixion took place and the Holy Spirit descended on humanity. They had one of the best church services on the planet. Now, listen, this is, this is going to get real for a second. They came into a church service. The Holy Spirit fell. There were flames sitting on everyone's head. They all spoke in tongues. 3,000 people responded to the altar call and gave their lives to Christ. That's the front door. 
Okay? This, this means something. That's the front door. What do you do after the hype, after the lights and smoke, after the worship service is over, and after the message stops? Because that's what builds authentic community. I'm not saying that the front door is not important. If you don't come through the front door, you don't get in. That's biblical. But the fact is that once the hype is over, community has to take place. Because the very next thing it said was that now when all things, people were gathered in one place, the Holy Spirit fell and the, the meeting just went nuts. But then something had to happen to, be able to, to enable them to sustain authentic Christian community. And it was they continued with the apostles' doctrines and prayers, meaning they got plugged in at a Bible study. They took their spiritual growth seriously. They took their corporate growth seriously. And they went house to house, breaking bread, having gladness and simplicity at heart, gladness and favor with all the people. So after we get past the front door, we have to be passionate about establishing real relationships. How many of you, listen, I want everybody to notice this because I had a young man at my house the other day and he said, uh, I said, you know, we want to let you get going so you can hang with your friends. He said, I don't have any. Just my girlfriend. How many of you struggle with loneliness and friendlessness? It's most of us. It's most of us. We need authentic community. The three things that community does. First, it is the evidence of the glory of God. Jesus said that, Father, I pray that they would be one like you and I are one. And when they see that they are one, they'll know that the world sent me. It's the evidence of authentic Christian community. Excuse me, it's the evidence of the glory of God as authentic Christian community. Matthew 5, 14 through 16 says, You are the light of the world, a city. Say city. Not a building. Multiple buildings. A city on a hill can't be hidden, nor do they light up a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Number two, a healthy community attracted the presence of God. In Matthew 5, 1, it says, And seeing the multitudes, say multitudes, he went up on the mountain and he was seated and his disciples came to him. Do you understand that Jesus was looking for a community? And because there was a group, because there was a multitude, it attracted him. When we're an authentic Christian community, the presence of God is available and present. Number three, small groups aren't new. They're necessary. I've, I've heard so many pastors, so many say, I don't agree with that new small group thing. Like, what new small group thing? It's 2,000 years old. It's 2,000 years old. But listen, sm- th- this is what's wrong with small groups. Because most people think small groups are, are mini church, and they're not. If you do mini church at small groups, you miss the point. Somebody brings an acoustic guitar, and somebody brings their Bible, you get all super spiritual, you miss the point. Because fellowship is just as spiritual as worship. I'm all over the place, guys. You've got to forgive me. This is prophetic. It has to be. There's going to be a shift. You're going to find real relationships. Listen, there are three things that humanity needs to experience the fullness of the presence of God. It's worship and His presence. It's communion and it's community. Ask me how I know those things. Go ahead, ask me. In the book of Leviticus, it outlines the process by which a human could enter the presence of God. And in the holy place, right before the Holy of Holies, there were three pieces of tabernacle furniture that they had to perform religious ceremonies at before they could access the fullness of the presence of God. On the right side, they had something called the table of showbread, which was referred to as the bread of his face. It was presence. It was time with him. In the front, there was the four-horned altar where they burned incense, and these were as the prayers of the saints. And you come to the left side, and nobody's got an explanation as to why there's a lampstand there. In the book of Revelations, it says that the lampstand is a solid piece of gold that is the body of Christ. And it houses, it manifests what the Bible refers to as the seven spirits of God. We experience the presence of God within a unified body. So you can pray 
and you can worship and you can be in your prayer closet all you want. You will not experience the fullness of what heaven has to offer until you do it in a community. Amen? Stand with me. Man, oh man. Well, I got a sermon for next week, I guess. We have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to, to display practically. This is, this, is, this is tough for people that have been raised in religion to understand, including myself. We cannot create a chasm between spiritual things and natural things. Because there are very practical and very natural expressions of the kingdom that we're responsible to come in line with. We were at a meeting the other day and somebody said, I've got a gluten sensitivity. And they said, well, why don't we just pray? And I said, well, wait a minute. I do believe that we can pray for your gluten sensitivity to be, to be gone. But the book of Genesis says, I've made every fruit and every vegetable for your food. Take and eat. So a practical expression of, the he- he- of heaven is what you choose to eat. It's just that simple. The Bible does say you can eat anything poisonous and it won't harm you. But if we want to come in line with the kingdom, the kingdom has principles. And the principles work every time. And one of the principles of the kingdom is that when we have authentic relationships and we can get in an environment where we have the ability to get real. Everybody say get real. We can get right. Nobody can ever get right in an environment where they're forced to perform something that is contrary to what they're actually experiencing. And only when you have a relationship with somebody where you can authentically be yourself. Can you grow? Now, the caveat is that the more that you're yourself, you are yourself in an environment of unconditional love, the more you're transformed into who you were created to be. 